Hello, my name is Klaus Eyer. I'm a assistant professor at the Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences. And in my lab and in my research, we are looking at vaccination and the impact of vaccination on the immune repertoire on a functional level. What is the mechanism behind mRNA vaccines? mRNA encodes the, the viral spike protein. So basically, it gives the genetic information of this protein to the host cell. To be translated into protein, the mRNA has to enter the cell and the protein has to be produced. Afterwards, the mRNA is relatively quickly degraded and the protein is transported to the membrane where it can be accessed by the immune system. So what's the difference between a viral vector and mRNA vaccine? Technically, both are the same. Both are using the same genetic information of the viral spike protein. In the case of an mRNA vaccine, we basically take this information and we produce a large messenger uh, RNA out of it. This has to then afterwards uh, enter the cell and has to be translated into protein. In terms of a viral vector, what we do is basically we take this gene and we put this into a different virus. So there's many different viruses that can infect human cells but do not lead to any disease or any symptoms. And we can use these viruses basically to transfect the cells. So basically it's a, it's a viral vector, it's a viral delivery vehicle that introduces this short uh, gene genetic sequence into the cell. Viral vector have been used in, in many different applications in gene therapy and there's also been two vaccinations that are based on viral vectors uh, from before, uh, MERS-CoV in clinical studies and Ebola which has been approved. So what is the advantage of mRNA vaccines over regular ones? There's several advantages and also several challenges. So first, we have a similar engagement with the immune system as we would have in a viral infection. Imagine this, uh, you have a normal uh, or you have an infection with SARS-CoV-2, so the virus binds to the outside of the cell. The genes are injected into the cell and basically transcribed. Afterwards, it's presented on the membrane and the immune system can interact with these and, and recognize these proteins as foreign and basically destroy the cell. In a way, when we use an mRNA to deliver vaccines or deliver uh, the antigens, we basically mimic this process. We inject the mRNA with only the protein that we want. This is then translated and, and, tr and transported to the surface where the immune system can react with it. So it's a very similar process between viral infection and vaccination with mRNA or DNA vaccines. Of course, there's also crucial differences. In the vaccine, we only have one gene where the virus has, a, has many different genes which are used for replication, for infection, for, uh, um, f to hide from the immune response. So those are all missing. So basically, we just get a pure immune response against that protein. There's a second advantage. We can rapidly adapt the mRNA vaccine to changes so this has not been uh, done or not been used at the moment, but what you could imagine is that basically the mRNA vaccine is just a sequence of different, uh, different chemicals. We can easily exchange one of these chemicals with, the, with a different one, and therefore we can rapidly adapt to mutating viruses. And the third one is also that when we use mRNA vaccines compared to classical protein vaccines, we need less quality control. For the mRNA, the important part is the sequence, the sequence of chemicals. And this is relatively easily controlled. If you imagine for a protein, you wouldn't have to have the right sequence, but also the right confirmation in three-dimensional space, which is much harder to, to assess using uh, biochemical methods. So those are the three, three advantages that I see, or the three main advantages that I see in mRNA vaccination. Of course, there's also the disadvantage of having uh, relatively unstable molecules that need to be transported at low temperature, which can be a challenge, especially in uh, developing countries. What new mRNA vaccines and treatments might we see soon? Originally, BioNTech has been developing these mRNA vaccines for cancer. So I would imagine that probably in the next five to 10 years, we might see some new mRNA-based cancer vaccines, or at least some clinical studies. I could also imagine that the mRNA vaccine, if, you've, if you go back to this uh, statement from the beginning, that it's relatively simple or similar engagement with the immune system as with a virus itself, they could be very good uh, candidates for viral immunization. 
That being said, I still think it's going to be very challenging for the whole distribution and delivery network because of the low temperatures that those vaccines uh, require. Which adjuvants are contained in a vaccine dose for mRNA vaccination? What purpose do they serve? So basically, we have two major purposes for the adjuvants that are for the helper molecules that are in the vaccination. One is the stability of the mRNA, and the other one is the delivery of the mRNA to the cell. So for the stability, usually mRNA in solution degrades relatively quickly, and we have enzymes in the surroundings, even on a normal plate, that are called RNases and degrade RNA in a few minutes to hours. So basically, we need to stabilize this mRNA in solution. And this is, for example, what the DSPC, it's a lipid, and the cholesterol, it, which are both in the formulation, are achieving. So basically, we shield using these lipids the mRNA from the surrounding enzymes. So therefore, it's much more stable, and we can have it in solution for a longer time. The second part is the entering of the cell. So the mRNA is a highly charged molecule. It's negatively charged, and it needs to somehow cross the membrane into the cell so it can be transcribed into protein. Here we have uh, cationic lipids that help this uh, transfer of the mRNA through the cell membrane. So for example, in uh, uh, the formulation, there's ALC0315, which is nothing else than a positively charged lipid, which basically helps the mRNA to cross the membrane. And then, of course, we have also some stabilizers, like lipids with a little uh, pack chain on it, or some uh, buffer salts or normal salts uh, to regulate pH and osmolarity to decrease the pain uh, by the administration. What generally triggers side effects? Is it the vaccine carrier, the vaccine, or the immune response? That's a very good question, but a very tough one to answer. Because usually, you, you cannot have one without the other. So if you lose the carrier, you do not have any immune response anymore. If you don't have any antigen, uh, you don't have any immune response anymore. So it's a very tough question that is uh, very hard to answer. But usually, if you don't have any immune response, you do not have any any uh, side effects. So in, in our lab, we do a lot of vaccinations or immunizations with different formulations. And when we don't add or when we don't trigger any immune response, there's no side effects. Side effects can occur, of course, when there's an immune response. And if you think about it, uh, headache, redness, uh, parex, uh, fever, and so on, those are all signs of a classical activation of the immune system. So I personally would say it's mostly linked to the immune response, but it's a very, very complicated interaction between your immune system, the vaccine components, and the antigen itself. Why should I do the vaccine a couple of times instead of getting it once and forever? I mean, that would be our dream, right? To get vaccinated only once and to be protected lifelong. In, in practice, it's not so easy. Um, basically, what the vaccination does, it prepares your immune function to respond to the threat. So basically, we will have, for example, antibodies, in the case of SARS-CoV-2 neutralizing ones, that are there and basically help to prevent infection and also prevent the effect of infection. So you have a milder disease. These antibodies might get lost over time, in, in a month, in a year, or over 10 years. And therefore, you have to, from time to time, remind your immune system of the pathogen to increase these functionalities again. Because as soon as they are below a certain level, you are no longer protected. Is vaccine development more trial and error or educated guessing? Vaccine development has been around for a few centuries. And in the beginning, it's true, it was mostly trial and error. I mean, in, if you think about the first vaccination trials in 1800s, most of it was trial and error. But I would say that in the last years, we have moved from trial and error to educated guessing towards rational design. We understand much better how the immune system works and how we can trigger certain functionalities in the immune system and what is important for vaccine-mediated protection. Of course, also today, we don't know everything, so we are still trying to figure out certain crucial questions surrounding SARS-CoV-2 and its immunity. But I would say we, we know much better of, or the people who develop the vaccines know much better what kind of pitfalls you might, might have and what kind of uh, what, what you need to trigger to get uh, vaccine-mediated protection. What will happen if we combine two separate mRNA vaccines? So if they are the same sequence, I don't think much will happen. I mean, your body will basically 
the same sequence will be translated into the same protein. So for your body, it will not make such a big difference. You might have some problems when you mix them that the two formulations are not uh, uh, supporting each other. But other than that, it might not happen so much. But if you think differently, if you would say we could combine different mRNAs from different mutants together and administer those to get a much wider protection, then it becomes very interesting to combine different mRNA vaccines. For the moment, this has not yet been done, but I'm pretty sure there's plans in the companies to do so. If it needs a booster shot after a few months or a year, does it have to be the same vaccine? Not necessarily. I mean, for the moment, we don't know it yet, for sure. There's a current, currently, there's a study ongoing in Great Britain that actually looks at this uh, specific question. But if you want to have my educated guess in that moment, I don't think it will make such a big difference. Because for your body, it might not be such a bit it might not be so different how you encounter the antigen, whether it's been delivered by a vector or whether it's delivered by an mRNA or by the protein. Of course, for the moment, we don't know. But my educated guess is that you don't need to have the exact same uh, vaccine. But we will see once the study has been pub or publishing its results. How likely is antibody-dependent enhancement for future variants of SARS-CoV-2? So basically, Antibody-dependent enhancements is something that we are very aware of since the last dengue vaccine trials, and we'd like to avoid antibody-dependent enhancement. So maybe just to, to give you a bit of background, there's two different ways the antibodies can enhance um, disease. So one is through um, mediating infection. So that's, for example, well, very well described for dengue fever viruses, where you basically Antibodies that are no longer neutralized help the virus to, inject, uh, to infect the cells. On the other hand, we could also imagine having um, antibodies enhancing immunity. So when you have immune complexes that deposit in the tissue, this is then a strong trigger for the immune response. And basically, uh, your immune system will start to attack uh, the complexes, but as well the tissue surrounding it. Those are the two main mechanisms. And if you think about the first one, so basically that the antibodies could help mediate infection. In the case of dengue virus, it's basically the cells that, that clear the virus, that basically bind to the antibodies, are the ones that are also infected by the virus. So basically what you do is you link together the virus and the cell that it needs to infect. Here with SARS-CoV-2, it's a little bit different because these cells do not express such high levels of ACE2 and the virus rather replicates in different tissue. So I don't think that would be a problem. On the second part, if you have immune complexes that, that are basically uh, deposited in the tissue and you have an immune response, there's always the risk that this might happen. But what's Important here is that you need a large number of viruses and we know that vaccination efficiently decreases the viral load, so the number of viruses in the tissue and therefore this is supposed or this is less likely to happen than if you would have an infection. For the moment there's still a lot of studying ongoing so we don't know yet but I don't or my educated guess I don't think it will be such an issue for SARS-CoV-2. What would you respond to people who worry about the long-term effects of COVID vaccines? As we have discussed earlier, most of the side effects of vaccination are linked to the immune response. And this immune response is done in four to eight weeks after vaccination. So also most of the, or almost exclusively, all side effects occur in this time span. We have a lot of studies done in preclinical, in, in animals, in in clinical studies and we have vaccinated over four to five hundred million people at the moment and we have so far not seen many long-term effects. On the other hand we know that COVID-19 and infections with SARS-CoV-2 can actually lead to severe long-term effects in patients and therefore that would be my response and the end it's a it's a personal choice but I can I, I would support that people get vaccinated and I will do so myself.